Welcome back to Movies Outpost. Today, we'll be diving into an action thriller movie titled Big Game. Enjoy the recap. The movie kicks off with a young boy and an elderly man entering a rusty cabin. They pause to observe pictures on the wall, which show young hunters proudly displaying their game as if they were prizes. Engaging in a conversation in Finnish, the man asks if the boy recognizes any faces. The boy singles out one image. The man confirms that the young hunter in that particular photo is him at the age of 13. After sharing this, the man exits the room, leaving the boy to gaze thoughtfully at the photographs. Later on, deep within the forest, a convoy of trucks makes its way along a mountainous road. Inside one of the trucks, the young boy's name is revealed to be Iskari. Beside him, driving the truck, is his father named Tapio. As they drive, Tapio rummages through the glove compartment and hands Iskari a map. On this map, a red cross marks a special location known to be abundant with game like deer and elk. Once they reach their destination, the group sets up camp. A gunshot rings out, signaling it's time for Iskari to begin his task. However, he struggles to start his vehicle. With a quick adjustment from Tapio, he's on his way. Reaching the clifftop, Iskari finds a bow and arrow waiting for him. He attempts to pull back the bowstring, but it proves too challenging, much to the disappointment of the onlookers. A debate ensues between his father and another man. The man suggests that Iskari isn't ready and should return home. Tapio, however, is adamant that his son is prepared. Eventually, the man relents, allowing the boy to proceed. He then delivers a motivational speech, declaring that Iskari has just one day and one night to venture into the forest alone and return with an animal he has successfully hunted. The scene transitions to a man named Morris as he prepares for his day. He shaves, glances at a scar on his chest, puts on a bulletproof vest, secures his earpiece and walks aboard a government aircraft, distinguished by the presidential seal. Two smaller planes accompany this main aircraft, ensuring its safe passage through the sky. Morris makes his way to the president's private cabin. Inside, the president William Moore is engrossed in a newspaper, expressing his frustration about his declining poll numbers. Morris informs the president that they will be landing in Finland within the hour. He also shares his intention to retire after this trip. In Finland, we return to the young boy as he continues his hunting journey. To hone his skills, he practices on a wooden statue of a deer. He's armed with a bow and arrow, but despite his efforts, he struggles to pull the bowstring. He instead imagines a successful hunt as he playfully acts out having caught and eaten his prey. Deeper within the forest, a helicopter breaks the silence. As it descends, the pilot's voice comes over the intercom, inquiring about the type of game the three passengers intend to hunt. One passenger by the name of Hazard cryptically replies, the big game. Upon landing, this passenger steps out, clutching a briefcase. He settles into a chair set up for him, taking a moment to appreciate the beautiful forest. To the pilot's astonishment, the passenger reveals a missile from his briefcase. Nonchalantly, he mentions his plan to use it against an aircraft. The pilot questions if the trio are terrorists. Hazard doesn't deny it, suggesting to the pilot that his best chance of survival would be to run. Taking this as a cue, the pilot dashes away. Seizing the opportunity, Hazard tests his missile, locking onto the fleeing pilot. When he launches it, the missile decimates a large portion of the forest, taking the pilot with it. On Air Force One, Morris strides through the plane, making his way to the cockpit. He's informed that they're approaching their destination, however, the comm is shattered when alarms blare, signaling an incoming missile. To make matters worse, the plane's defense systems are malfunctioning. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Morris orders an immediate evacuation. The plane jolts violently. Morris, acting swiftly, grabs the president who's missing a shoe and ushers him into an evacuation pod. A team of guards follows suit, launching their pods and deploying their parachutes. However, one guard realizes that the parachutes aren't deploying correctly. He tries to warn Morris, but Morris, in a shocking turn, shoots the guard. Without hesitation, Morris straps on his own parachute and leaps from the plane. Moments later, the missiles strike Air Force One, creating a massive explosion just as Morris descends to safety. Iskari witnesses the plane plummeting from the sky. He's thrown to the ground, screaming in terror. When he finally rises, he's met with the horrifying sight of a forest engulfed in flames. Meanwhile, at the Pentagon, a woman urgently informs a man about the crash of Air Force One and the President's evacuation via an escape pod. As they navigate the corridors, she introduces the Vice President to the man, identified as Fred Herbert, a seasoned CIA operative who now heads the terrorist intelligence unit. Fred, with his expertise, confidently states that it was unmistakably a terrorist attack, likely orchestrated by a group of five to ten men. He deduces the type of missile used and theorizes that there was an insider who sabotaged the plane's defense systems. With a determined look, he just says, let's bring him home. 
At the forest, Morris's parachute is stuck in a tree. He unhooks himself and falls to the ground but is relatively unharmed. He radios in to call the other agents, but no one answers. On a different device, he mutters cryptically that the angel has fallen. Now Ascari looks around the wreckage, bow at the ready. He spots the president's evacuation pod and throws a rock at it. Creeping closer, he knocks on the door. A knock answers back as a finger tries to write a message on the pod window panel. It's the code to open the door. Iskari types it in and the pod opens. He runs back quickly as the president exits the pod, lighting a flare and yelling for Iskari to show himself. The boy stays hidden but uses his arrow to throw a paper cup tied to a string at the president's feet. The president picks it up and holds it to his ear. From the other end, Iskari speaks, asking if he's an alien. The president replies he's from Earth and comes in peace. With that, the boy emerges from hiding. The president proves his identity by showing Iskari his passport, and the boy tells him there's no village or town nearby. Meanwhile, back at the Pentagon, they've tracked the president's escape pod and are sending helicopters to find him. Switch to a farmhouse in Norway. A dog barks at something, prompting its owner to come out and investigate. He finds a beeping device underneath his trampoline. The device is the escape pod's tracker, which seems to have separated from the pod. So the government helicopters return home, unsuccessful in locating the president. At the crash site, Morris and the three culprits responsible for the plane's destruction converge on the president's escape pod. To their surprise, they find it empty. Elsewhere, the president treks through the forest with Iskari guiding him. As they walk, Iskari shares that he's a hunter and assures the president of his safety under his protection, brandishing his bow and arrow. The president seems skeptical but chooses to trust the young boy. Iskari then leads him to his vehicle, and the president requests to be driven to the nearest town, however, Iskari declines, revealing that he's on a special mission for his birthday. Reluctantly, the president settles into the back seat, and they embark on their journey through the dense forest. Back at the escape pod, Morris examines the footprints and deduces that someone aided the president's escape. Out of nowhere, he shoots two of the guards, then turns to Hazard, vowing to deliver the president to him. Inside the Pentagon, Fred begins his investigation by researching hunting companies in the area. He then requests that satellites be repositioned to provide a comprehensive view of the terrain. Iskari stops his vehicle, pointing to a red X on his map, indicating an ideal hunting location. They decide to set up camp there preparing a meal over a crackling fire. As they chat, Iskari with a hint of curiosity, asks the president about the essence of power. He then shares a piece of his tradition. Mentioning his father, a local legend who bravely hunted a bear at just 13, in their tradition, boys of 13 venture into the forest to hunt, marking their transition to manhood. This is the very challenge Iskari is now navigating. The president, drawing from his own experiences, advises that sometimes it's not about true strength but the perception of it. He lightens the mood with a humorous personal story, and amidst the laughter and shared tales, a bond forms between them. The following morning, the president is awakened from sleep by the peculiar sound of Iskari mimicking deer calls, attempting to lure in prey. Iskari, having found the president's missing shoe, tosses it towards him. Without missing a beat, he continues his ascent up the mountain, persistently making deer calls. However, these calls don't just attract the attention of wildlife. Morris, Hazer, and their men also hear them. As Iskari scales a ledge, he stumbles upon a large freeze box. Inside, he finds a freshly killed deer accompanied by a note from his father wishing him a happy birthday. Not far from this discovery, the president encounters a grim sight. The lifeless bodies of his guards scattered across the terrain. It becomes evident that their parachutes were sabotaged. Arming himself with a gun from one of the guards, the president takes cover behind a rock. From his vantage point, he observes Morris and Hazer approaching the campsite. The realization dawns on him. Morris is the traitor. The president hurries to Iskari, who's disheartened by the dear gift, feeling it undermines his abilities. To uplift the boy, the president hands him his pin, symbolizing Iskari's role in safeguarding him. However, their moment is cut short when the president reveals they're being pursued. As Morris confronts them, Iskari in a brave act draws his bow, aiming at Morris, but his attempt falls short. The president, unfamiliar with firearms, fumbles with his gun. Morris swiftly disarms him, and a fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat ensues. With Morris gaining the upper hand, the president yells for Iskari to flee, which he promptly does. At the Pentagon, officials track the enemy helicopter, tracing its path back to the president's location. Through surveillance cameras, they witness Hazard disembarking. 
Fred recognizes him, revealing he is an illegitimate offspring of a wealthy golf oil tyrant, and labels him as a certified psychopath, Hazard, with a twisted sense of humor, decides he wants to preserve the president as a trophy. He transfers $10 million to Morris's account as a reward. The president is forcibly placed inside the freeze box, and Hazard seals it shut. From his hiding spot, Iskari observes the unfolding events, feeling a mix of fear and determination. The Pentagon dispatches a rescue team, but they're too far to act in time. Drawing inspiration from a photo of his father, Iskari musters the courage to act. As the helicopter begins airlifting the freeze box, Iskari makes a daring leap from a ledge and onto the box. Morris is alerted to Iskari's presence and attempts to dislodge him by maneuvering the helicopter through trees. As bullets fly, Iskari urges the president to escape the freeze box. In a desperate move, he uses a knife to sever the box's connection to the helicopter. For a brief moment they evade their pursuers, but Morris, relentless, opens fire on them, forcing both Iskari and the president to seek shelter within the freeze box. Using his body weight, Iskari tips the box, causing it to plummet and roll upon landing. Though battered and bruised, both Iskari and the president emerge relatively unscathed. Using the freeze box as a raft, the duo drift down the river, unexpectedly coming across the wreckage of Air Force One. At the Pentagon, the Vice President directs the Navy SEALs to the new location. However, he catches Fred discreetly texting. Simultaneously, aboard the helicopter, Hazard receives a cryptic text from an unknown sender, Just Kill Him, accompanied by coordinates. The President and Iskari abandon their makeshift raft, swimming towards the half-submerged Air Force One. They clamber onto the upper deck, a grim scene of casualties from the crash. Their brief respite is interrupted by the sound of footsteps. Suddenly, the roof is torn open as Hazard repels down setting a bomb with a five-minute timer. As he radios for extraction, Morris betrays him, leaving Hazard stranded with the President and the ticking bomb. A fierce struggle ensues. With Iskari seemingly incapacitated, Hazard tries to subdue the President. Just as he's about to succeed, Iskari intervenes, striking Hazard. The president wrestles the gun away from Hazard, unloading a barrage of bullets into him. With the enemy neutralized, the imminent threat of the bomb remains. As Morris fires from the helicopter, the duo activate the cockpit's emergency evacuation, propelling them skyward. They become level with Morris, and seizing the opportunity, Iskari releases an arrow from his bow, hitting Morris. While his bulletproof vest prevents the arrow from penetrating, it dislodges a piece of shrapnel embedded in him, causing him to plummet from the helicopter just as the bomb detonates in a massive fiery explosion. Tapio sits in his jeep, anxiety evident on his face as he sees the distant explosion from the river. Suddenly, a yellow parachute descends onto the car. Navy SEALs swiftly emerge, pulling Tapio and the other hunters from their vehicles, forcing them to the ground. The explosion's aftermath leaves the lake obliterated, and back at the Pentagon, officials are convinced that the president perished in the blast. The VP, anticipating a swift ascent to the presidency, is already envisioning his swearing-in. However, behind the scene of chaos, another parachute gracefully lands. Iskari with the president by his side makes a triumphant appearance. A heartfelt reunion ensues as Iskari introduces his father, Tapio, to the president, who commends Iskari as the bravest individual he's ever encountered. The SEALs promptly relay the good news to the Pentagon, confirming the president's safety. Fred, looking visibly upset, discreetly exits, prompting the VP to follow. In the seclusion of a bathroom, the two converse in hushed tones, revealing a shocking plot. Hazard was a covert operative, employed by them to assassinate the president. Fred, seeing the VP as a liability, eliminates him, staging it as an accident. Back at the crash site, Iskari and the President become the center of attention, posing for photos amidst a backdrop of government helicopters. This iconic image finds its way to the very cabin where Iskari had admired other photos at the movie's beginning. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you on the next one.